Welcome to this important discussion on childhood obesity prevention. And the focus of this first part is, uh, or the first webinar is setting the stage. And I'm the first part of setting the stage. And so I will provide some background statistics and, and evidence substantiating the importance of this issue. Um, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Chaput and Dr. Rain, will uh, elaborate on those. So to begin with, here's the most current information on childhood obesity prevalence in Canada. Approximately a quarter of Canadian kids are overweight or obese. Uh, you can see the different colored bars. Um, uh, the red bar is indicating that about 8 or 9 percent, different uh, across age groups a little bit, but 8 or 9 percent are obese. However, the more recent information using different cut points shows that you get different results in prevalences of overweight and obesity depending on which analytical method you use. Typically, most of what you're reading in the literature is using the IOTF, or the International Obesity Task Force method. From the US, you'll always get the CDC method. Many medical organizations in Canada have recently adopted the new World Health Organization growth standards. And when you use those data, you actually see that the prevalence of overweight and obesity in childhood is much, much higher. Over a third of Canadian kids are overweight or obese. So watch for this in the future, as I think this method will be that, uh, the one preferred by most an, uh, analysts. Now we also see that the prevalence of overweight in, uh, in Canada varies substantially with ethni ethnicity. You can see here this analysis that we did a, a couple of years back where the difference between um, self-ascribed North American Aboriginals is about three times that of East and Southeast Asians. So it's important to recognize that the childhood obesity levels are not uniform across all ethnicities. And indeed, if we look uh, more closely at the Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal population in Canada, you can see in both men and women, boys and girls, there is significantly higher prevalence of overweight or obesity um, in the Aboriginal population. If we split that out to look at just the prevalence of obesity, that's the difference between this slide and the previous one, you can see that the difference is even more pronounced, suggesting that the maturation really of the obesity problem in the Aboriginal population is, is more developed and, and more serious among boys, girls, men, and women. This, of course, leads to a whole host of biological, psychological, and sociologic problems related to uh, neurology, uh, cardiovascular issues, endocrine issues, musculoskeletal issues, renal, gastrointestinal, pulmonary, and of course psychosocial issues as well. And we don't have time to get into this here, but I, I think it's beyond debate the negative consequences associated with this explosion in childhood obesity. And one way to look at this and understand and try and develop strategies to overcome this is to, to look at it as a transition. And so here I'm looking at dietary energy intake, so the energy in part of the equation, and conveniently categorizing diet um, as the quantity of healthy and the quantity of unhealthy, so the proportions of those um, in terms of our daily intake. And at the top, you see, I've, I've put low and middle income countries in 2000. And so this is using a cross-cultural comparison model to try and understand what's happened over time. Below that, we have high income countries a century ago, and below that, high income countries today. And what I'm proposing here is that across time, we're seeing this evolution of not only an increase in dietary intake, but a substantial increase in the quantity of unhealthy foods consumed across time. And so this is referred to as the nutrition transition. And evidence of that can be seen as we look at cross-cultural comparisons around the world. So here, a family's uh, weekly food intake from a high-income country. And as we transition around the world, we can see the significant difference that occurs in energy intake in different parts of the world at the same point in time. Now, if we look at trends in caloric intake, we actually get a bit of a paradoxical situation going on. So if we look across the last generation between 1972 and 2004, we actually see that in all age groups uh, and both sexes, an actual decline 
in self-reported energy intake based on 24-hour dietary recalls. Similarly, we see a reduction in calories coming from fats across the same time period. So this would be a very good news story, uh, although I don't think there will be many people listening that believe these data. Nevertheless, they're the best available data. However, if we look at indices of dietary quality, uh, as indicated here, the percentage breakdown of, of uh, sources of calories, we can see that, and this is in childhood from the Canadian Community Health Survey 2.2, uh, that about a quarter of the calories uh, from kids' uh, dietary intakes are coming from uh, the other food category, uh, which is certainly not a desired quantity. We can also see that it's in the neighborhood of two-thirds of kids in the country that are not getting the minimum number of servings of fruits and vegetables. And this is similar across all age groups. And finally, if we, if we just use sodium intake as an indicator of dietary quality, you'll see here that virtually all the age groups, um, kids are way beyond the uh, upper limit of, of recommended uh, sodium intake. Now if we switch to the energy outside of the equation, activity energy expenditure, same model as we saw with the energy intake. Low and middle income countries today, high income countries a century ago, and high income countries today. Uh, and broken down into four convenient categories of activity, school or occupation, domestic chores, transportation, and leisure. And these are theoretical data, but again, the same idea here that energy expenditure is much higher in low income countries. Uh, work that we're doing in, in rural Kenya, for example, or even high-income countries a century ago compared to high-income countries today. And I think what's most noticeable as we examine this physical activity transition is not just the shrinking of the total volume of activity, but which components seem to be shrinking. And indeed, we believe that it's the domestic and transport portions that are shrinking the most, yet often receive the least attention. And this physical activity transition is substantiated with measured pedometer counts in Canadian children and youth living a contemporary lifestyle where the counts are between 10 and 12,000, Amish kids that uh, are more in the 13 to 16,000, and rural Kenyan kids that are up around 17 or 18,000 steps per day. Evidence using this cross-cultural model of a physical activity transition. The Active Healthy Kids Canada report card, which many of you will be familiar with, reports each of the last six years that Canadian children and youth are receiving a failing grade when it comes to their physical activity levels. If we look at the most recent data from the CanPlay uh, survey from the Canadian Fitness and Lifestyle Research Institute, we see that only 12% of Canadian children and youth are uh, meeting Canada's physical activity guidelines of 90 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. Little bit of differences across the provinces. And so this has received a failing grade. If we look at the other side of the uh, energy expenditure equation, so the amount of time we spend sedentary, um, these are data from the recent Kaiser Family Foundation report on media use in 8 to 18-year-olds. These are American data, but I believe reflect well of what's going on in Canada. And you can see across time periods, 1999 to 2004 to 2009, this creeping up of media use in every category, whether it be television, computer, video ga or video games. And the media exposure is the sum of them. The media use in the far right uh, column uh, is the media exposure adjusted for the multitasking that kids do. But nevertheless, you see it's in the neighborhood of seven or eight or nine hours per day of non-schoolwork related media use, where kids are almost certainly sitting stationary. And indeed, 90% of Canadian children and youth do not meet the guidelines related to uh, sedentary behavior. Now to switch gears into fitness, we were fortunate to have new data from the Canadian Health Measure Survey from Statistics Canada on the fitness of the nation. And with these data, we were able to compare the 1981 Canada Fitness Survey with the 2007-2009 Canadian Health Measures Survey. So these next few slides uh, have the same sort of format. Here we're looking at the mean body mass index. This is boys in the top 
age category 7 to 10, 11 to 14, and 15 to 19. The hatched line is 1981, the solid line the more recent data. And so you can see significant differences in body mass index um, in all age categories across time. And these are large unit differences, some t cases two full BMI units. We see the exact same pattern for females. We can also look at waist circumference and we see the same pattern here again for males and again for females. We also have some of five skin folds from this survey and we again we see the same pattern and look at the seven to ten year old boys here going from 37 millimeters uh, to 51 across one generation. That's nearly a, uh, um, a, uh, a third increase in the amount of subcutaneous fat measured and we see the same pattern in females again. So very significant, very meaningful changes in morphologic fitness across one generation. Now the next few slides show uh, this sort of format and so we're looking at same age categories, um, males in the blue bars and females in the bars to the right uh, across time, 81 through to 2007-9. And so here we see uh, clearly that females are uh, weaker than males, but that there's a pronounced difference between 1981 and 2007 with all age and sex categories going down remarkably. We see a similar pattern for flexibility, only now we see clearly that females are more flexible than males, but across time, both males and females in all age categories are showing a significant decline in flexibility. So these silhouettes show the transition that's occurred across the last generation in boys and girls from 1981 to 2007 This being a typical 12-year-old boy, and the various statistics are here, I won't read them for you, but to summarize, they show very clearly that children are taller, heavier, fatter, rounder, weaker, and less flexible than in 1981. And these results forecast accelerated non-communicable disease development, increased healthcare costs, and a loss of future productivity for Canada. Now, if we just look at the life of a typical Canadian, here reflected as Homer Simpson, where he's off to work while sitting in his car. He spends his rigorous day at work um, sitting idle. Similar return trip home. Some quality time with the family at home. And is this an active day? Well, everyone would say no, certainly. But if he goes for a 30-minute jog, then by most physical activity guideline standards, it's been an active day. And I believe from a public health perspective, this has been one of our fundamental flaws in saying that if you meet the little exercise goal, which may represent 2% of the day, the rest, the other 98% of the day doesn't matter. And that's a false premise. So let's just look at this, this uh, confusing slide here. And so the, the pyramid to the left shows a typical sedentary person's pattern of energy expenditure. So this is activity energy expenditure of a typical person that doesn't do any exercise. And they still spend about 700 kilocalories per day in activity energy expenditure, almost all of which is through NEAT, or non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which is incidental movement just things that we do uh, that are not purposeful exercise and a little bit of active transportation on top of that. Our typical approach as public health professionals would be to take that person and say you've been naughty and we need you to get to exercise several times a week for 30, 40 minutes at a certain intensity and so on. And so we introduce that exercise bout uh, into their lives and that's the red tip in the after uh, pyramid. And what we're finding is that when you do that for people that do not have a propensity to be physically active, they compensate through the rest of the day by actually reducing their non-purposeful movement. And so you see the behavior compensation pyramid there, that we've introduced exercise, but the total daily energy expenditure has actually gone down because they did their exercise and they move less because of it. They may even do more incidental eating because of it. So it becomes actually an obesity-promoting uh, program. 
And so if we look at the, col uh, the pyramid to the far right and, and we pay attention to the third dimension here, the intervention possibilities, by introducing inconvenience into the lives of people, this non-exercise activity thermogenesis or incidental movement, we can do that anywhere any time and there's tremendous opportunity to increase the volume of movement, the volume of muscle contractions, the volume of energy expenditure as a result of that. We can do that most effectively by reducing sedentary behaviors above and beyond the introduction of exercise and I believe that's something that Dr. Chaput will elaborate on in his Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to acknowledge the groups and colleagues that have contributed to my work over the years. Enjoy the webinar.